Hi, James. Uh, we're in the boardroom of the law school, and uh, well, we discussed having an interview to put you in our gallery of distinguished visiting professors. I'm on. And um, I was thinking, you know, what things would be interesting to ask you. Um, and I think the first thing I would want to know, and I think my colleagues as well, and the students, how did you? become interested in international refugee law? What triggered you to this particular field of law rather than any other field of law? Yeah, as my mother puts it, big fish, small pond. Uh, I do one thing. It kind of is true, and I, and I actually am very happy about that, by the way. I think that's the idea of going deeply into one thing has been very satisfying, and the sense that I know maybe just one pond, but it's a pretty important pond. Um, and it's not something I thought about when I went to law school. I mean, I intended to be a civil litigator. I loved debating. I loved oral advocacy. That's what I intended to spend my life doing. I spent a term, as many Canadian law students do, in a legal clinic for credit uh, in my second year, uh, a poverty law office where people who couldn't afford lawyers would come for help and the students would provide it. We'd go to court for them and provide advice and that sort of thing. Uh, and it was the late 1970s when Argentinian and Chilean refugees were arriving in Canada. They came to the clinic because they had no other place to go, and they came to me because I spoke Spanish and nobody else did. Uh, and I sort of saw the lights go off. You know, I'd studied international politics as an undergraduate. I've always been fascinated by current events and sort of the political constellations of the world. And all of a sudden I had people before me who were effectively the victims of precisely the events I'd been studying, whose stories were more compelling than anything I'd ever heard, who raised incredibly tough legal issues in a regime that was pretty obvious to me at that stage, quite underdeveloped. And it really excited me. It excited me because I was working on intellectually tough issues, but in a way that made a huge difference to the real people sitting in front of me. I mean, I still remember my first clients, you know, Leonardo and Sandra Astudillo Espinosa, right? You never forget your first clients. And after we won their refugee claims, they were both working as dishwashers in a Toronto restaurant. And I remember the pride they had when they had absolutely no money in being able to invite me to a meal in their restaurant that they prepared and served, right? And that just kind of was fabulous, and I felt great about it. So even when I briefly practiced law after graduating, I had an arrangement with my law firm that I had one day out of five a week that I could do free representation for refugees, and they were very good about always allowing me to do that. And then when I ultimately was convinced to go into academic life, uh, the only thing that I could imagine wanting to spend several years writing a dissertation about uh, to get the graduate degrees that I needed was refugee law. And so it all came together in a way that I hadn't anticipated. So you're referring to um, research for a doctorate, and I think that became your 1991 uh I mean, it generated three articles. I wrote a couple of articles about refugee law in Canada, and then I actually wrote one of the articles that I'm actually most proud of, which was the reconsideration of the underlying premise of refugee law piece, and that was the final piece for the doctorate. But I did a lot of the background work for what became the Law of Refugee Status book at the same time. I still had energy in my 20s. Well, I know you still have a lot of energy, but um, the law of refugee status is really about the definition of refugee, and um, uh, quite recently a new edition uh, was published, a very bulky one and a very well, very interesting uh, new edition, I would say. But can, you know, can we conclude or infer from that that your, primary, your prime area of interest within international refugee law is and remains the definition of refugee? You know, I'd, I'd say actually there are three things, and I keep returning to all three. Uh, one question is the definition, because that's the linchpin to the entire system. If you don't meet the definition, you get nothing. But the second thing, in a way that I'm at least as proud of, is having written the first book on the refugee rights regime as a whole, integrating it with all of international human rights law. So not just who is a refugee, but what does a refugee get? And then the third question that I 
return to over and over again is how to reform the system to make it work. So who is a refugee, what are their rights, and how do we make the system work? And basically, everything I've done with a few minor deviations is focused on one of those three questions. You were referring to, uh, to one of the publications as a very dear one, the, the, the reconceiving the underlying premise well, was, of... Yeah, a reconsideration piece. And the idea was really to challenge the idea that this was either an immigration or a humanitarian regime, to actually see it as interim human rights protection for people at risk. And as bizarre as it sounds today, I mean, developing the idea of refugee law as human rights law was thought very controversial back in the early 1990s. And I think, you know, that article really challenged people to think of it as a human rights mechanism rather than as a migration regime. I think it's fairly generally accepted. Which is. You're exactly right. I mean, It's, it's not something we would question. No, 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 no. But, but actually, it's funny because I wrote a piece once called Reconceiving Refugee Law as Human Rights Protection. Which yes. everybody thought was massively controversial at the time, right? And nobody thought this made any sense. And you're right. I mean, this is what happens when you live long enough. You know, things that you thought were controversial. So, for example, the idea that refugee protection is substitute protection of human rights, the idea that groups like gender and social group uh, and, and sexual orientation are social groups. I wrote about this in 1991. People thought I was crazy. Uh, that failure of state protection was as much a refugee issue as a malicious state. That too was thought hugely controversial when I wrote about it in 1991. So you're right. In, in many ways, large parts of the thesis of that original book are now accepted today and are quite uncontroversial. You're right. Yes. We've had a great 20 or so years in refugee law, really, to be truthful about it. It's you know, it's the single most important human rights mechanism in the world. It's been kept alive by some extraordinarily able judges working around the world, listening to each other, and writing what I think are very creative decisions that have effectively renovated refugee law time and time again. So just as you think there's a dilemma that causes people to be left out, usually judicial creativity can find a way to bring people inside the tent. So it, again, to take another example, does anybody seriously question that gender is a form of social group that warrants refugee protection today? No. Even the European Court of Justice said that sexual orientation as social group was easy and uncontroversial. Well, 20 years ago, no one thought it made any sense. So these are the ways in which it makes, has, made, has been a lot of fun to stay involved with this field. It's been constantly reshaped and evolving over the time that I've been working on it, which is perfect. I would like to know a bit more about um, your work and activities, which are not that visible for the, you know, not, not that easy to, to, to see for us as academics, because we will see your books and your lovely articles. I mean, I really like what you write a lot. Uh, but I know you travel around the world, and I must confess you have this odd map of the world with all your travels mm. on the Michigan Law School website. But This is Michigan. You know, they like high-tech things. You have to let them have some so fun. So you travel a lot. That's, that's clear from that picture. But I know that you're traveling and advising uh, governments and training uh, judges. So could you, you know, tell us a bit more about what we don't see, but mm. I know you're doing it, mm. and uh, I know you went to Nepal, that is all your, all, there is something on the website of Michigan, but you just returned from Israel where you, I think, trained Supreme Court yeah. judges, and yeah. so perhaps you could say something about law reform in mm. particular countries, which countries, how does it work, what do you do, right. and the second part about uh, training the judiciary and well, it, decision it, makers. And the truth is it varies dramatically from year to year and from context to context. So basically, I guess for the last 10 years, I've been making two round-the-world trips every year. Um, and on each of them, I'll do 8, 10, 12 different things, depending on what's on the agenda. So you're right. The UNHCR uh, some years ago invited me to come to Nepal to be sort of the honest broker uh, the NGO community had been invited by the government to present ideas on whether Nepal should accede to the treaty, and if so, what the legislation should look like. Uh, and for whatever reason, the NGOs who couldn't agree among themselves what they wanted that to look like could agree that I could be the person to chair that consultation. And so 
It was fabulous. We had competing NGO drafts for a national law on asylum. We worked our way through all of the issues over several days, and then I had the chance to actually sit down with officials of the government to talk about what we had achieved and what we thought the right way forward was. I mean, to be truthful, that was a tough one, because if you were Nepal sitting in the middle of a whole lot of conflict zones with big powers around you and not a lot of resources coming out of a brutal, horrid, long civil war, agreeing to accept refugees unconditionally is a big deal. And of course, you know, ultimately the government didn't survive and the legislation didn't happen, uh, you know, long before the earthquake took its toll on the country. So. It was a good experiment, but at the end of the day, we came close, but we didn't succeed because political forces were nonetheless bigger than the agreement of the community. But I, I, I spent a lot of time training uh, lawyers, non-governmental advocates, government officials, but particularly judges, I will say. I think I've trained decision makers in, I don't know, 20, 25 countries at this point, and I give particular attention to that because I think judges have really proved themselves the arbiters between power and principle. They have the authority to do things that bind governments and yet unlike politicians they're primarily driven by principle rather than by the need to be reelected. And so uh, the establishment of the International Refugee Law Judges Group is something I worked closely with in the early days and I really believe in the idea of judges talking to each other, learning from each other, and becoming the means by which we implement refugee law. It's not scholars, it's not the UNHCR, it's not governments, it's really been, in my view, the judges of the world who have kept the system alive for the last quarter century. So the chance to work with them, as you say, in Israel last week, uh, you know, working with non-governmental activists in Latin America two weeks before that, sitting down with government in New Zealand in between the two. I mean, these are all the sorts of things I like to do. So uh, one of my colleagues refers to it as, you know, being an engaged scholar. And I, and I like that feel. It's what I always set out to be, someone who would not only think, but who would be engaged with the real world and try to help ideas shape the course of real events. Talking about real events and um Thinking of Nepal, or at least Southeast Asia, we are witnessing new tragedies which remind us of the 70s with the Vietnamese boat refugees. Right. Um, don't you think we, it, it, it is, well, odd, considering the development of international refugee law, that uh, the system is failing us somehow, or not perhaps the system, but, well, the world is failing the refugees in such a massive way, because it's not just boat refugees in yeah. Southeast Asia, which really reminds me of the time that the same countries refused to accept um, the, the, the refugees people. from landing on the shores. Right. Uh, but we have the same in the, already for a longer time now in mm -hmm. the Mediterranean Sea. Um, and beyond that, of course, the massive outflow of refugees from Syria. Somehow we, we are not prepared for those crises. And uh, how do you feel, for, for especially let's start with that one, with the, the new crisis in Southeast Asia? Well, as you say, in many ways it's a repeat of things we've seen before. And it's not as though the Rohingya haven't been oppressed for a very long time. And it's not as though anybody's cared about them up until now. They've been a disfranchised population brutally disfranchised on racial grounds from their own society and are in desperate need of an opportunity to be protected. But what we have in that region, as you know, and we've got roughly a quarter of the world's governments that have not signed on to the Refugee Convention. They are disproportionately in South and Southeast Asia. And so in that region, we have a paucity of states that have actually assumed any obligations to refugees. Uh, some people want to pretend there's a customary duty not to send refugees away, but I'd say take a look at the state practice. Take a look at what we're seeing right now, which is exactly the opposite. States are indeed refusing arrival, refusing entry, precisely the opposite of what the proponents of custom would suggest. So the truth is we've got a gap. This is the third piece of my work that I was telling you about at the beginning, to try to think of ways to make it possible for states to agree to the definition and the rights, uh, 
you've got to come up with a system that's pragmatic, that takes state interests seriously, that balances them out, that ensures that rights are at the forefront of how we respond, but in a way that states will agree to it. It doesn't do anybody any good to blather on about how important the rights are if in practice they're not respected. At the end of the day, what matters is what happens, not what we say. And so I think you know the reformulation model that uh, a group of a hundred or so others and I uh, nearly 20 years ago now developed that focused on global burden and responsibility sharing, that focused on international administration rather than state by state administration, that tried to see refugee law as protection for the duration of risk rather than as a disguised immigration system. There's enormous potential right now to liberate international refugee law in a way that would allow states in regions like Southeast Asia to see it as non-threatening. I mean, if you actually believed that when you said yes to a refugee arriving at your territory, A, it didn't mean they were staying in your territory forever, B, it meant that somebody else would share the responsibility to protect with you, and C, you actually knew that there would be guaranteed, not charity, but guaranteed resources to allow you to cope, you might respond very differently. Right now, we leave the governments on the front lines with virtually nothing. You know, you take a look at a country like Turkey with 1.8 million refugees. No wonder they slammed their doors shut. You know, this is absurd. We've got 3.8 million refugees in three adjoining states to Syria, and the rest of the world is doing what? Chattering on about distributing 200,000 or so that have arrived in Europe with no thought to doing anything for the 3.8 million who are still where they began? So if we go on like this, refugee law will die. It's dying slowly right now. It's dying because states have not shown the goodwill to renovate the system. It's dying because the UN Refugee Agency has shown no intellectual leadership in terms of prompting states to talk about how to reform it. And quite frankly, it's dying because a lot of advocates cling to the tried and true ways that aren't willing to take a chance on a system that would protect the refugees they don't see as much as the refugees they do see. So it's a lot of different strands leading to the problem, but the bottom line is that the majority of the world's refugees are not getting the rights to which they're formally entitled, and that's what's got to end. That's the problem. We cannot simply go on the way we've been. So what we're seeing in Southeast Asia may simply be a very big visible manifestation of the breakdown of refugee rights, but long-term indefinite detention in much of Africa behind barbed wire is also part of the reality, right? And we don't talk much about that. Can I ask you something more about that particular fact? Because for me, one of the real sad, apart from the boat, yeah. uh, refugees and obvious tragedies with the, with the attempts to, to reach any shores, uh, is the fact that uh, we live in a world in which you are or can be born as a refugee, and your parents do, your great-grandparents do. We, have quite a number of protected refugee situations. I think 60% of the world's refugees are living for over five years yeah. and sometimes decades in, in camps. Uh, we have Western Sahara refugees, uh, the Palestinians, of course, Afghans, uh, many forgotten uh, others as well. Uh, you really referred to the fact that uh, refugee law is meant to be a temporary uh, protection for the duration of risk. Mm -hmm. For some people, the risk is an indefinite. Uh, for me, I wonder whether that situation is not affecting the, the system in a negative way. I mean, we cannot honestly think that looking at Syria and all those refugees, that they will be able to return right. within five years. I don't think anyone will believe that. Mm -hmm. So what would, does that mean for... Yeah. And yet you would the have, idea of a temporary protection system. You would have thought, though, wouldn't you, that um, states that wanted ultimately to be able to require refugees to return home would have a built-in self-interest in fixing the problems that would allow refugee status to end and people to go home, and yet it doesn't seem to happen, right? Which then sort of begs the question whether their rhetoric about actually being as, as opposed to long-term admissions, in fact, is borne out in their practice or not. I think there's a lot of dissonance here. There's a lot of different messages coming out about these things. I mean, the only problem that I have with the sort of analysis you put on the table is that I think sometimes people uh, 
unfairly criticize refugee law for the failure of will on solving problems. I mean, refugee law is not meant to solve problems. Refugee law is the palliative system that exists in parallel with the interventionist human rights and security systems. If the human rights and security systems are working well, very few refugees will be produced. If it's working poorly, then more refugees will be produced. So, you know, it, it would be a criticism akin to saying that, you know, hospital emergency rooms don't work really well because there are still drunk drivers on the streets running down pedestrians, right? I mean, the drunk drivers aren't the problem of the hospital, but it is the case that the more drunk drivers there are on the road, the more people end up in the hospital, right? So I, again, you know, really insist strongly on disaggregating the interventionist from the palliative, because I think when we talk about it, when the UNHCR has historically talked about it, it seemed to suggest somehow that refugee law had a role in fixing problems. And I think when we go down that road, we really confuse the missions of two distinct but complementary regimes, and we end up doing them both poorly. So I'm a big believer. I'd love to see an era in which the responsibility to protect was something more than rhetorical nonsense. It would be great to see a world in which the promise of human rights and the security system actually were delivered. And if we did, we'd see fewer refugees. But I don't think refugee law should be held hostage to progress on that broader agenda, because it's the only thing that keeps people alive until and unless the other system works. I fully agree, but my point or question would be uh, You're allowed to make a giving, point. giving the fact that we have these protracted situations, and we are getting more of them, it may jeopardize the valuable system we have because it will be perceived by governments as, you know, once you let them in, they're there forever. I mean, and you cannot blame states like Pakistan or Iran or, well, mention a few more, from thinking that. And they will not, um, and, and for me, we reach here limits to the system. So mm -hmm. it's not about blaming the system. It's, of course, the, the, the causality is a different one. But it may affect a very valuable uh, yeah, regime. I, I think that's true. And I, so I guess the point then is that refugee law reform isn't going to fix that. What's going to fix that is a more serious commitment to the values of the UN Charter and to the human rights system. And I'm a big believer in that. But... You know, the concern is that if we, I think if we fixate on that too much, I'm not saying that your comments are wrong, I agree with where you're saying, but if we focus too much on this, the implied message is why don't we then just shut down the refugee system because states feel it's hopeless and it isn't doing what it's supposed to no, do. No, it's more my fear that states yeah, will actually, I know, and you, we I know get it's not your right message. wing, right wing parties right. actually suggesting we should get rid of the convention. Right. So. So part, maybe part, well, part of what we need to do, though, is to actually find ways to be a little more creative about finding means for refugees ultimately to be protected in places other than where they first arrive, right? To share out the responsibilities a bit more broadly. I mean, when you, I think, quite rightly pick an example like Pakistan and say, my God, look at the number of refugees that they've protected for a very long period of time. Do they feel bruised by their experience? I would be shocked if they didn't, right? Had we, at the time of the Afghan and other arrivals, taken a more active role in really, really coming to the aid of Pakistan, both financially and in terms of responsibility sharing, resettlement and otherwise, I wonder if Pakistan mightn't have a different view about it. But we left them out there in a way that I, th I think is unconscionable. And that's what happens in most of the world. I mean, this is why we've got 85% of the world's refugees in the world's poorest countries. If the whole developed world shut down tomorrow, quite frankly, it would make a marginal difference in terms of the number of refugees who did or didn't have protection. That, that's not the world I want to live in. And so this third piece to my research agenda really is focused on trying to get us to not change the Refugee Convention in any way. I think it's a brilliant treaty. But to change the way that we actually do the job of protection, I think we can do better than what we're doing now. I think we don't need state-by-state state administration anymore. I think we could go back to a common international system. 
There's no state that seeks to admit refugees anymore. We don't need to have the power to actually designate people as refugees as we did during the Cold War. And we could save massive sums of money, uh, in the view of our economists at least, dramatically more than it would cost to fund a brilliant global system of protection just by harvesting the funds that we spend on assessing refugee status today. Well, I know it's talking about uneven and, and overburdened states. Uh, yeah. uh, let's think of Lebanon, where mm. every one out of four persons exactly. is a refugee at the moment. So it's impossible it's for us to even imagine what that looks like, isn't it? I think it would signify 80 million refugees going to the uh, United States. I think exactly that is right. the comparison. And you know, you look at the ratios, I mean, you're right. One, one in four in Lebanon, the ratio in Europe right now is one refugee for every 1,900 Europeans. The same ratio in the United States approximately. So we're not even on the same scale. Not only are the numbers dramatically different, but the level of difference is so dramatic that we really have reached a point where it's unethical for the North to pretend that it's actually sharing in the system. May I infer from, um, from what you have said that, um, because it was one of my questions, I'm mm. so wondering what is your, what will be your ultimate academic goal? <laughs> um, I, what is on your wish list? And, you know, especially considering what you just explained. I'm it's funny when you, be part of it. when you phrase it that way, it's intriguing because I'll be honest with you, the first thing that came to mind when you said the ultimate academic goal, it has been for some time to help a generation of new young people get deeply involved in this. And I've been thinking, I guess, as I approach my 60th birthday, a little bit about you know the dozens and dozens of people that I've worked with over the years who are now working in difficult places, who are judges themselves, who are policy makers, who work with the UN, who are fabulous advocates. And I guess I always have thought my ultimate academic goal really is to stimulate other people to care about the issue and to devote themselves to it. And I really have been very lucky. Uh, not only Michigan, but Amsterdam and Melbourne have provided me with incredible homes and access to great students over the years, many of whom are now doing what I really care about. I guess personally what I'd like to see is for us to move toward a regime that actually is of the kind I've described, one that's sustainable and one that cares as much about the refugees in the less developed world we don't see as about the tiny number who reach us. So what will you do? Well, we've relaunched the reformulation project uh, just in the last few months. I, I did so by a speech at Stanford. Uh, in April, and I followed that up with speeches in Latin America, New Zealand, Israel, Germany last week, here this week. We're trying to get people engaged again in the idea that we can do the Refugee Convention differently than we do it now. In fact, the preamble to the convention, as you know, recognizes the fact that if we simply require every state to do the job in the treaty alone, it will impose unfair responsibilities and burdens on those who are closest to the place of origin. So we've got an unfulfilled promise sitting in the preamble that again, no government, no UN agency, indeed very few scholars have engaged with this. And so it's something that I really do feel powerfully about. And as much as I want to basically keep a pincer movement going, keep strong on the definition and the rights so that we get victories in the courts that actually compel governments to see that their options to treat refugees poorly are fewer than they believe. And that gives them an incentive to think hard about ways more efficiently to respond to refugee flows around the world through burden and responsibility sharing. So in a way, I think all three strands of what I've been doing kind of mutually reinforce, and I'm committed to all of them. But I do feel now that if I could see one thing happen that you know, would be sort of the summit of moment, it would be to see the reformulation model or something similar to it on the international agenda so that next time we have Assyria, and tragically there will be a next time. That's just the history of the world. We don't end up with three overburdened states and millions of dispossessed refugees with no place to go. That's the tragedy. We have seen this many times. We've learned, I thought, the lessons of each of our prior failures, and yet we've never systematized a response to actually deal with it for the future. So it's time to learn the lessons of history. But, it, I mean, you referred to the preamble to the 1951 convention. Uh, it was a controversial uh, 
preambular provision at the time already. I mean, I think it was France who actually wanted to have it inserted because France was sitting at that point in yes. a major point. It yep. had the Spanish Republicans fleeing right. to in, in massive numbers at the time to right. France, but no one wanted to. Uh, right. I mean, there were, I mean, I think France three times had to reintroduce it to but get it included, and it did not get a binding counterpart. Yeah, but, in but, but, but look at the convention. So my question would be. What has changed? Well, all right. So be a little optimistic. What's happening right now? For the very first time, yes, the yes. European Union right. is actually talking about doing serious responsibility sharing. The formula that they've come up with, I think, is not quite right. But the idea that states who have more capacity, to put it simply, ought reasonably to take on a greater share of a common responsibility makes sense. right? I think if Europe could just show a bit of leadership and instead of just worrying about the 200,000 refugees that have somehow managed to get here, to actually worry about the rest of the 16 million refugees in the world, so that we were taking their idea and making it more generalizable for the world, then I think we'd be in a very exciting place. So Europe is, it may, it may not be doing it well, but at least it's having this conversation, right? Yes. And it's being being applauded by UNHCR. The, immediately there was a press release. So, do you think UNHCR UNHCR should now take up your earlier Absolutely. challenge and I've been do saying this for 20 it? years, though, and I think only the UNHCR has the institutional authority to show to take a leadership role on reforming the refugee regime. Yes, it needs some critical state partners in that regard. It can't do it alone. But if the UNHCR is not on side, it's not going to happen. And that, quite frankly, is the reason the reformulation model didn't take off in the first place. You know, we had half a dozen governments already signed on uh, in principle. We had leading intergovernmental groups, non-governmental groups, scholars from north and south. Everybody was on board, and the UNHCR stood on the sidelines. And that's a problem. So the agency, over the years, has become more of a tents and blankets agency than a protection agency. The Deputy High Commissioner recently said that he believed it needed to become more protection-oriented and focused again. I'm with him on that, and I'm hopeful that this will be the centerpiece of that reorientation. You know, that refugee rights are only meaningful if they actually translate to action on the ground. It doesn't do any good to hold the convention up if most refugees are detained or can't work or ultimately can't be reunited with their family. That doesn't make any sense. And that's the world we're still living in. So let's hope that UNHCR will actually well, do something about well, it. Well, UNHCR, and again, you know, I called last week on the German government to show leadership on this. Within Europe, for example, the German government is the best player on a bad team. They've done a better job of protecting Syrian more refugees yeah. than have others. They have the credibility, I think, right now to stand up and say, look, we haven't done a great job, but we've done a reasonable job, and we now believe that what we're suggesting for Europe actually has resonance for the world. So I'm actually, you know, I've always been hopeful. If you're not hopeful in refugee law, you may as well just slit your wrist now. Uh, you stay hopeful, and you work hard at it, and you get some victories, and you push them as far as you can in the hope that ultimately things evolve in the right way. You earlier, I think, um, I, I have a last question. <laughs> you earlier referred to uh, two students. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I hope the interview will be on the website and I hope students will watch it. Um, I really wondered, thinking back of your own life as a student and the choices you made in the career you pursued, what would you, you see, uh, honor students, bachelor students this mm -hmm. afternoon, uh, tomorrow you will have uh, a lecture for the um, um, LLM students, mm -hmm. uh, but more in general, because those will be people who will, you know, already interested in international refugee law. But uh, thinking of, of the law school more in general, what would you advise, mm -hmm. if you have any advice, or if, what would you advise to students who, well, have everything ahead of them, are still in, in the process yep. of making fundamental choices, or at least choices will, which will affect yeah. them for many years to come. Look, I think we've become too structured. I think we've become focused on getting people to make decisions prematurely about what they want to do with their legal careers and lives. I mean, if I learned one thing from my own story, it was the serendipity of being in a clinic with Latin American refugees who opened my eyes to something that I had never considered. I planned to be a civil litigator, never planned to be an academic, much less that I planned to teach refugee law. Right? 
So I think what students need, if I can be honest, to do more of is uh, keeping their eyes open and experimenting a bit more. Take that course, take that seminar that you're not sure about. It isn't exactly the one that may give you the bread and butter that you now think is going to be the core of your life. But you could be completely shocked. It could be the one that opens your eyes to something new. Get involved in a clinic. Do some pro bono work on the side. Do an interesting summer project in a part of the world that you've never been to. Try something new. So don't, I think, lock yourself in too quickly is the short piece of advice. The, the, the gorgeous thing about a law degree is how mutable it is. People have very different careers from the beginning to the end. It's a degree that really opens doors inside and outside of the formal legal system, in fact. And what I worry about is that too many students too quickly lock themselves into something and then find 10 years later that they're unhappy because they haven't experimented enough to actually see what would give them joy in the practice of law. So that's my, if I have any advice at all, it's unusually for me because I'm a relatively structured person. But when you're a law student is your last time, I think, to really open yourself profoundly to lots of different options and don't make a decision too quickly so that you actually have a chance to discover something that will make you happy. Thank you very much. You're really welcome.